so far we learned about so far we learned a lot of different concepts about microservices and in the end of the session all we have to care about is how to deploy them and then let the third party or the ui or the other service access these services for that we need to deploy these microservices on some place it could be a server virtual machine or a container or in cloud wherever it is and then let um, those services run and then made to be accessible by ui or whatever services now before deploying them we need to set some of the deployment goals and here the list of the deployment goals um, we need to achieve when we are deploying these microservices on the servers so the first one is scalability and throughput and definitely why while we are de deploying these microservices we definitely have to think about scalability because we need to that's what it basically provides uh, throughput or uh, to scale our applications up um, or scale out so we definitely have to think about scalability and the next thing is reliability and availability obviously we are building microservices for a reason because we need our application to be high available and also it should behave reliability uh, reliable so reliability and high availability is very important so the third thing is isolation when we are deploying our services one services shouldn't really affect um, or should disturb the other services which we have deployed so we need a pure isolation around these microservices where we were deploying and the fourth one is resource limit and obviously we can't just let this server uh, services consume whatever resources or how much ever resources they want to in the server wherever we have deployed say for example if i have uh, specified that this particular microservices uh, microservice is going to take um, say one cpu and two gb of ram that means that that service should be allowed to consume only that much resource not beyond that so we need that feature as well and the fifth one is monitor obviously monitoring is the trivial part of uh, maintaining these applications so we need to somehow be able to monitor all the deployments or the uh, services which are running on the service and also the last but very important um, goal is the deployment should be cost effective that means we have to utilize our resources wherever we have deployed these services to the maximum extent and um, keep our billing on the cloud infrastructure or server cost low so that's what which makes cost effective and also makes business profitable so let's see what are the different patterns available or people use in industry uh, to reach or uh, to achieve all of these goals uh, when deploying the microservices so let's understand the very first deployment pattern called as multiple service per host as the name suggests it is running multiple services in a single virtual machine or a physical server is called as multiple server per host pattern so as the image shows here this is a one virtual machine or a physical server in which we are running microservice one microservice two okay that's what it basically about you can run more than one uh, microservices it could be 10 or it could be 15 microservices but that's not really ideal situation but um, just to give an example you can run as many number of microservices in the same virtual machine and that's what this pattern is all about usually these services run as a separate process of the same operating system there could be for example this service is also written in java this also on written in java that means you can actually run one tomcat server and both will be the instances of the same tomcat server and serve the traffic or if this one is on python or this is on java maybe you can deploy separate servers and configure uh, to redirect the traffic here so uh, it doesn't matter how you basically configure it's this pattern says uh, you can run multiple services on it this is very traditional approach usually now also we do the same thing like running multiple uh, services on a single machine but this is not really advisable because it's uh, has its own drawbacks um, but this is what we used to do there are much better patterns which uh, the industry has adopted uh, these days um, let's understand uh, the advantages and disadvantages of this pattern uh, yeah before that how do we scale here so if you want to scale out all we have to do is add one more virtual machine or a physical server and run the same copy of the services over here as well and then you need to load balance then we have microservices uh, upon running 
on multiple servers or virtual machine. That way, you are basically scaling out um, based on uh, how much you're, uh, based on the traffic which you are receiving. Um, that's the scaling part. Now, the advantage of using multiple server per host pattern is it is very efficient in resource utilization. Uh, if you ask me how, basically, if you see in an in a virtual machine, we are basically running one or more services in here. So even if the service is not really serving a lot of traffic, maybe this or other services which are running in the same machine might be busy and using as much as possible uh, hardware resources and try to serve uh, more traffic. So that way, at any given point of the time, most likely one or the other services will be efficiently using um, the uh, hardware resource efficiently. Or it could be a situation where every service is serving a lot of traffic. That means that they basically try to maximize uh, the utilization of hardware. Either way, we are utilizing hardware and it is very cost effective for the business. Uh, and the second one is faster deployment. And if you ask me how, it's that key. if you just start one server, you basically have a place where you can actually deploy a lot of uh, other services, a lot of different services. That way, um, it's much faster to deploy. What are the disadvantages of this pattern? So the first one is poor isolation. If you see, both services are actually living in the same operating system. That means right, this service might disturb the other service at any point. Say, for example, if this service is placing some temp file in some directory, maybe this server service might delete those things. Uh, this is just a very simple example, but there could be a lot of different use cases where one service can affect the other services. It could be on the resource consumption as well. What if this guy or this service is consuming all of the resource available in this server and it is not leaving any hardware resource for the service at all? That is the second disadvantage uh, that we can't really uh, limit the resource per service. So what happens is, as I said, uh, any service can utilize all of the resource available and it might starve the other resource um, and they will never able to serve more traffic. Um, and the third one is dependency conflict. Say, for example, these two are Java application. What if this guy using some package of some specific version and this service is utilizing uh, using the same package of a different version? There could be possible conflict of the libraries uh, which are used, or it could be the OS level libraries which is conflicting to run this uh, service as well. So we have to have a one more isolation layer on top of it um, just to uh, resolve the dependency conflicts. And that is kind of like it increases the complexity of uh, you know deployment. Now let's learn the second deployment pattern called as service per VM or container. Um, so in this pattern, what it says is you basically deploy my, your microservice in one virtual machine or in a container. So this is how it looks. So basically, if you think this as a virtual machine or a container, you basically have only one microservice which is running inside of it. There is, um, you are not supposed to run multiple services in here at all. So that way, if you want to really scale out when there is high traffic or huge demand of uh, uh, throughput or whatever, so you basically add one more instance of the virtual machine or a container and let it run. How you basically add is you basically will have an image which is already built for a given microservice. Maybe image one is for microservice one or you will have one more image for microservice 2, you basically, if you want to scale up the microservice 2, you basically take this image um, uh, and then you scale it up, uh, deploy it to scale it up. Uh, if it is VM uh, you are using to run this microservice, then it will be a virtual machine image. Or if it is a container, it's basically a container image, which you basically use it. Uh, those are pre-built images, okay? Um, that's how you basically scale it. Now. Using virtual machine was how we used to scale all these days until we basically started to adopt containerization, right? Um, but now containers are hottest um, uh, thing which we are using in all of our microservice deployment. Uh, but un until now, we used to use a lot of virtual machines for uh, deploying these things. 
say uh, VMware has a lot of tools which you can actually use it to scale up or scale down. In your, if you go to AWS, you have auto scaling groups and uh, all the dynamic load balancing, where it basically adds an EC2 whenever you see high traffic. But if you want to scale the containers, and um, there are container orchestration uh, technologies like Kubernetes or Docker Swarm, which basically does the same thing. You basically uh, give the images; uh, it automatically scales based on the uh, based on so many factors. It could be based on um, the number of requests coming in, or it could be based on CPU or whatever. So many other um, different uh, based on different parameters. Um, now, what are the advantages and disadvantages of uh, having a service per VM container? And also, let's discuss a little bit more about uh, what are the specific advantages of having VM versus containers and etc. The advantages of using a service per uh, VM or container is, the first one is isolation and secure. Um, this is slight different when it comes to virtual machine and container. Uh, let's discuss uh, the advantages and disadvantages specifically for VMware and container as well. The advantage of using this pattern is uh, better isolation and it is secure. How, if you ask, if you look at this, we are actually running one microservice in one instance of virtual machine or a container. That means that this service cannot really touch any other services which are, even though if they are running on the same server, or same hypervisor or whatever it is. So it is very uh, isolated from other services and it is also secure. Uh, when it comes to virtual machine, it is really secure. Container is like highly secure, but there are some cases where it is uh, not treated as secure, but it is still a better option to go with. And the next one is manageable. Uh, when we say manageable, it means that it is very easy to deploy and scale out. As I mentioned, we have a lot of technologies like Kubernetes and Docker Swarm, which basically manages all of these um, instances of um, deployments. So it is much easier. And, um, and the third one is it is fast, uh, but this is specifically for container. If you want to spin up one more uh, instance of the service, in con if you are using container, it is really, really fast because containers are very lightweight. It is not really running the, all of the operating system on it. So it is much faster. But if you are using virtual machine, it is not really fast. Um, okay. And, uh, and the fourth one is auto scaling. So auto scaling should be much easier because you have an image. You just need to spin up one instance of that image. So auto scaling when using virtual machine or container should be much easier compared to the previous pattern that is multiple service per virtual machine or per, per physical server. Um, so these are the advantages. And um, what are the disadvantages? So the disadvantage is slow in case of if you're using virtual machine, as we discussed, um, since the virtual machine runs the entire operating system, um, the size of the image for virtual machine will be higher because it has the whole operating system in it. And it also takes a little bit more time to copy the image to wherever server we are, we want to spin up one more instance. It takes time to copy. And also virtual machines are a little slower in booting up uh, because it takes time to start the whole operating system. So that way, if you're using virtual machine for uh, service per VM um, way of deployment, then it is a little slow. But if you are using container, containers are fast. It spins up one container much faster. So it is it's still fine to go with container. And the next thing is not really efficient in utilizing the resource because it has to run the whole operating system. Whereas if you are using container, it's not really running an operating system. So it is very lightweight and it is not going to consume a lot of resource just to run um, the container itself. But in case of virtual machine, it consumes a lot of resources just around the operating system itself. Um, so it is not really efficient. Um, and then third one is not so secure, but as we discussed, if you are using only container, uh, it is secure, but not to the level of the security which virtual machine provides. But no matter what, what is the industrial um, trend or the uh, most used way of deployment is uh, service per container, it's not the virtual machine. We used to have service per virtual machine until a couple of years back, but now the industry is moving forward with containers 
and uh, with the high uh, you know uh, high time for kubernetes and uh, docker uh, everyone is actually using containers for deployment of microservices so let's learn the third and the last uh, deployment pattern for microservice is called a serverless uh, as the name suggests it is uh, serverless it means that basically there are no servers involved in our deployment at all then you might be thinking where the hell my code runs your code definitely run on one of the server but you don't need to really worry about um, scaling up or uh, scaling out the servers or instances of your microservices or maintaining them uh, configuring um, you know service registry api gateway and all of that stuff you don't have to worry about anything just that you have to write your piece of code which basically accept a request and then you basically return the response how exactly it works is say in case of aws console you basically log into aws lambda aws calls it as aws lambda in google cloud they call it as google cloud function azure calls it as azure function basically every major cloud provider supports serverless with different names um, so what you have to do is log into your console. They basically give you a place where you can actually paste the code or you can write your code, basically the business logic. And then that's all you need to do. Uh, you need to make a little bit of configuration, um, like API gateway setting, something like that. And once you do that, you have your service or an API up and running in the whatever cloud provider you selected. So how it works is, you basically store the code of that function or the service in the cloud provider. They basically know when to trigger that piece of code. Usually it's by HTTP request. They trigger that function or the code which you have placed there. Um, and then after processing, you basically return whatever response and they basically send it back uh, as a HTTP response. Um, th these um, functions are not just used for HTTP request and response. They can be triggered based on different events which happens across the uh, cloud platform. Say for example, in AWS, uh, if there is an S3 uh, bucket, uh, you want to trigger this particular piece of code or a function which you have put in there or a service uh, which you have put in there um, on based on some of the events which happens on S3. Say in S3 bucket, if someone uploads an image, you can configure it to trigger this function and you can access that image and do some processing on that and then just exit. In case of HTTP, you basically uh, triggered on a HTTP request on a specific path, and then you will basically return the response or do some processing. But while you're configuring for HTTP, you will actually need an API gateway. You already that uh, you already learned API gateway. You know all the functionalities, right? In this case, the API gateway is also provided by the um, same uh, cloud uh, infrastructure provider, and then you just need to define the path at which uh, the this function is will is going to be triggered and or maybe you're going to mention what method or http method it is going to get triggered so whenever there is a request coming in on that specific path with that particular method your function which is configured will get executed and you will basically send the response back so it looks so easy then why the hell we actually took a lot of time to learn all of the different concepts and components of microservices um, you might be thinking that actually it is true that you don't need to really worry about all of these things if you are actually using AWS Lambda or, you know, serverless functions. But it's not entirely true because there are some of the limitations of using serverless, um, serverless way of deploying. So we will talk about it uh, later. So let's understand a little bit more about it. So now you can ask a question then how, how do they scale it and how the scale out or scaling works. Say for example, when the request comes in, this function is working right now. Now suddenly more number of people are coming into your uh, service or more number of requests are coming in. How do serverless manage to scale? For that, the answer is you don't have to worry about it at all. And you don't have to worry about adding more servers or containers or VM, VMs or anything the cloud infrastructure or the cloud provider will basically scale these functions to more instances or whatever it is you don't really have to worry about it all you have to worry about it is put a code put the code or business logic into uh, that um, serverless functions and that's all you need to do so even though this uh, your you, your application is getting one request per second 
still works or one request per day it still works if you are getting 10,000 requests per second still it works that's the beauty of serverless and the cloud provider does not give you access to configure any of the background or, or the, the internals of how they scale it they will take care of it you don't have to worry about it it's just that they always make sure that that function is going to be scaled automatically irrespective of what is the number of requests coming into that service or that function absolutely zero worries um, that's the beauty of beauty about it um, you don't get to get to know whether they are using containers or whether they are using physical servers whether they are using ec2 or virtual machines to uh, scale that you will never know and they will never let you know they basically do it all in their back end so now it's i think time to understand what are the advantages and disadvantages if this is so cool then why don't we really use serverless everywhere okay let's understand that so the advantage of using serverless is first one is focus on the code only right um, so generally when we are thinking about deploying microservices in our application we always think about infrastructure and how do we handle um, such a huge uh, number of requests and all of that, right? In serverless, you don't really need to worry about it. You just need to write the business logic and put it there, scaling uh, uh, and, you know, maintaining all of that stuff, stuff, the cloud provider will take care of it. So you just need to focus on the code. So the second advantage is no worries about the scaling. I think we just discussed about it. You don't need to worry about it. They automatically scale it. The third one is pay as you go. This is the really uh, interesting part. <clears throat> so uh, how the billing happens. In case of EC2 or virtual machines or any other servers, you basically, uh, the, the cloud provider basically count the number of minutes you're, you have used that particular machine or the resource based on the type of virtual machine they're going to bill you, right? Say, for example, simply uh, $1 per hour is the billing rate. If you use it for 10 hours, uh, no matter you are using it to serve one request per second or you know, 10,000 requests per second in that using that machine, you still end up paying uh, 10 R into $1, that is total $10. But in this case, it doesn't happen. The billing is calculated based on the number of requests which uh, the, the platform handled for this specific function, plus number of time or number of seconds or minutes which this function took to execute. And also based on the resource like CPU and the RAM uh, which it consumed. So it doesn't really matter you have uploaded your code and you never need to pay if your service is getting zero request per second or zero request in one day. You don't really need to pay anything. You can just have all of the service available in say, for example, AWS, and you are paying zero dollars a month or anything because no one is really using that zero requests for your service. But on, a, on one fine day, if someone figured out there is a really good service, um, and started to use it immediately, maybe you're getting 1,000 requests per second, they automatically scale it, and you have your service available, and the billing starts to count uh, based on how much the resource usage and number of requests. So you just basically pay the bill only when the service is used. So that's a really cool thing about it. It's like pay as you go based on number of requests from the resource consumed. So now it's time to understand what are the disadvantages. So the first one is, um, not all of the run times are available for in, in the serverless platform in, in say, for example, AWS, there are only limited number of run times available. Um, some of the famous other commonly used run times are obviously available. But if you want to run your uh, some new language which you have built, maybe um, that's not really possible or some of the mm, not really used uh, uh, run times are definitely not available and, uh, and also handling the third-party libraries you can't just go uh, into this platform and then you know do apt get or pip install that's definitely not possible uh, the only way is you can package uh, a bundle uh, of all the dependencies and you can also provide along with this function so and it is available in some specific path maybe in slash opt or someplace and you will have to import from there uh, that's also one disadvantage and the second one is it's actually kind of expensive uh, i said that okay the billing is really good because pay as you go but in an overall if you can, can you know consider 
uh, how much you actually pay when your uh, service is really uh, used um, every day and every second. Um, there is a certain threshold um, when the number of requests actually crosses that threshold. You actually kind of pay more money when you're using uh, serverless. serverless um, but when you're using EC2, maybe you would have paid a little less. Um, that's the one. I think I think definitely you should read blogs where they have compared about uh, what is the pricing uh, difference between serverless and when you use EC2. Um, read about it, you will basically understand in better. Uh, the third one is vendor lock. Um, basically what happens is if you write your function specifically for AWS Lambda, you can't just take that same code, put it in Google Cloud Functions and run it because some of the um, uh, request response is specifically uh, you know, written or customized or that code is actually dependent on a specific cloud platform. In case of AWS, we basically uh, write code um, to access the objects which basically AWS provides uh, when the function call happened. So you can't really take that code and run it in somewhere else. So it's you basically have to be uh, using that code only on this platform. So there is a vendor lock of possibilities. And the fourth one is uh, debugging pain. And definitely uh, you will not, you, ca you can't run the whole service serverless setup on your local machine. So it's very difficult to debug and um, check what's happening really. Um, though there are some of the tools available where you can actually simulate uh, serverless on your local machine and then try, but that's in general, uh, it is always pain to debug uh, serverless code um, on any of the cloud platform. And the fifth one is stateless and short running processes only. Usually um, these functions are executed only when the request comes in uh, and they die immediately once the request is went back. It doesn't really remember anything which happened earlier. So that uh, gives you a hint that yeah, your code, uh, whatever you use it along with the serverless platform should be stateless. It can't, it can't be stateful. Uh, if you really want to have some states preserved or something, you will be basically have to write it into some elastic cache or database or S3, and then you'll have to do a lot of things. So usually these are the functions which are really uh, useful to do some processing, which are short lived and which are, you know, stateless. Um, and also uh, these are really good for short lived uh, because uh, say for example, in AWS, you can't really have a request and response cycle, which actually goes beyond five minutes. Uh, it actually gets timed out. So there is a hard timeout for the request and response to finish. Um, so anything you execute should be, should be finished before five minutes. Uh, you can't just keep on running for hours and hours. So that's one more pain point. Um, I think, um, yeah, I think I will explain more or less all the important things related to the serverless. Uh, there is open source um, version of serverless also available called as OpenFast. Uh, if you don't really want to use any of the cloud providers and you want to set up your own cluster of serverless um, you know, deployment, then you can actually use OpenFast and then deploy it on your cluster and then try it out as well. Um, yeah, I think this will be the last video in this series of sessions about microservices. Uh, I think um, definitely this will help you to understand what really microservice is and um, all the different component, uh, components of the concepts that your microservice definitely it will help to uh, help in your interviews also uh, and makes your uh, microservices concepts stronger. Um, so if you really like this uh, session, please share uh, with your friends. Like any YouTuber says, please share, subscribe and comment. Um, thanks a lot. I think I'll, I'll try to include all the um, you know, interesting uh, links along with the videos. Um, and as usual, thanks a lot for watching. Um, do subscribe if you haven't. Uh, thank you.